right, well, we are back in Colossians again this week as we've been journeying through the book of Colossians for the last six weeks. And in week seven, we are going to be in Colossians chapter number three. And today we're going to be talking about what it looks like to have new life in Christ. And so if you weren't here last week, I want to kind of recap just a a little bit about what David talked about and and brought out as we finished out chapter two last week. And so last week, as we we talked about the ending of chapter two, David brought uh, some things out about what it is to step out of the shadows and stepping out of the shadow and how that all these things that we've been talking about in chapter two were, were just shadows of the things that were pointing to the substance, which is Christ. And so what we learned last week is that Jesus must be the center of our lives. Jesus must be the reason we live. He must be the reason that we love. He's the reason that we care. And that is to be our motivation, is that. And this should give us enthusiasm. It should give us gratitude um, because of who Jesus is and what Jesus has done. We should be different That was what we talked about, that we're to be different. We must make sure that every day we focus on walking with Christ and and what that looks like. And that Jesus is the one who develops us. Jesus is the one that grows our roots. As we talked about a couple of weeks ago, as David brought out about the the, uh, Chinese Chinese bamboo tree, right? And that was, that really like, I've thought about that for the last two weeks, that in the first i make sure I'm getting this right. The first four years, there's no growth. Can you imagine? It's kind of like the prophet Isaiah. You're going to go and you're going to preach and you're going to, you're going to share the gospel. You're going to try to make disciples and you're not going to have any converts. You're not going to have any disciples. And you continue that for, for four years. But then in that next year, how many feet did you say it grew? 90 feet in the next year it grows. And, and so I've been thinking about that for those last couple of weeks. That it's Jesus that, that grows our roots. It's him who makes us fruitful. But most of all, it keeps us from being, he's the one that keeps us from being self-centered and self-focused. And so we, those are the things that we've talked about the last couple of weeks. But this week we're going to be in chapter 3. We kick off what it looks like to have new life in Christ. And I want to share this quote from pastor and author John Ortberg. He, said, he talks about conforming to boundary markers And he says that they're often substitutes for authentic transformation. And I want you to listen to what he says. He says, the church I grew up in had its boundary markers. A prideful or resentful pastor could keep his job, but if if ever the pastor was caught smoking a cigarette, he would have been fired. Not because anyone in the church actually fought smoking a worse sin than pride or resentment, but because smoking defined who was in our subculture and who wasn't. It was a boundary marker. As I was growing up, having a quiet time became a boundary marker, a measure of spiritual growth. He says, if someone asked me about my spiritual life, I immediately would think, have I been having regular and lengthy quiet time with the Lord? My initial thought was not, am I growing more loving toward God and toward people? But then he goes on to say, boundary markers change from culture to culture, but the dynamic remains the same. He says that if people do not experience authentic transformation, then their faith will deteriorate into a search for the boundary markers that masquerade as evidence of a changed life. Now, I want you to really think about what he's saying. We are so guilty of that in America, in the Western culture, and really, to be honest, we default towards that everywhere because it's in our flesh to look for boundary markers. Why is it that he used that example of of the pastor getting caught smoking would be an offense to fire him, but yet it's okay to be prideful? Why? Because pride can be concealed. Pride can be masked. But we look for things that are external, that we can use as markers for spiritual growth or a lack of spiritual growth? Why is it that when we're asked about a quiet time, our growth, our, excuse me, our walk with the Lord or our, our spiritual growth, we think, well, how have I been doing reading? How have I been doing praying? How have I been doing? We, we think of things that are measurable. Why is it we like to look for these externals? Because we tend to look at them as markers for spiritual growth something that we can measure, and and they're not accurate measurements for spiritual growth. 
And Ortberg makes that very clear that they change from culture to culture is what those markers are. But if you and I are not experiencing authentic transformation through the person and the work of Jesus, he's saying that what we're going to do is we're going to eventually deteriorate our search into boundary markers that substitute for real, true spiritual growth. And, and we are so guilty of doing that. I've been guilty of doing that. So let's talk about what it looks like to have authentic transformation in our life and to have new life in Jesus. What does that look like? So because of our participation in the death and the resurrection of Jesus, we are partakers of this new life that is offered to us. And in this new life, we have security. We have freedom from fear. We have uh, the power for dealing with the influence of hostile powers in this world. And so I want us to back up for just a moment before we begin reading in chapter three. And we're going to go back and reread a few verses that David read last week in chapter two at the end, because I think it's very important for us to connect these two passages together. Um, as, as we talk about a lot in our small group on Tuesday, when scripture was written, there were no divisions, there were no chapters, there were no verses, it, they were just letters. And so it's really important for us to back up because the end of chapter 2 connects with the beginning of chapter 3. So let's look at verse 20 in chapter 2 and finish out chapter 2, and then we're going to start in verse 1 of chapter 3. Here's the word of the Lord. If you died with Christ to the elements of this world, why do you live as if you still belong to the world? Why do you submit to regulations? Don't handle, don't taste, don't touch. All these regulations refer to what is destined to perish by being used up. They are human commands and doctrines. Although these have a reputation for wisdom by promoting self-made religion, false humility, and a severe treatment of the body, they are not of any value in curbing self-indulgence. So, if you have been raised with Christ, seek the things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will, also, then you will appear with him in glory. Therefore, put to death what belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desire and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, God's wrath is coming upon the disobedient. And you once walked in these things when you were living in them. But now, put away all the following, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and filthy language from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, since you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self. You are being renewed in knowledge according to the image of your creator. In Christ, there is not Greek and Jew, circumcision and uncircumcision, barbarian and Scythian, slave and free, but Christ is all and in all. So chapter three of Colossians is going to mark a shift in the book. Up till now, through the first two chapters, Paul's letter to the church at Colossae has focused on more doctrinal instruction and, and kind of getting that down. And now Paul is going to make a, a shift to practical application. So now as we begin chapter three, we're going to learn what it looks like practically for you and for me to apply what we've been talking about in the first two chapters of Colossians. And so let's jump into to that. And so the thing I want us to understand before we start breaking down the text is, is this overall arching idea. And it's this, being in Christ and continuing to remain in him is the only thing that brings moral growth and truly changes our behavior. So we have to understand this as we, we work our way through the passage and as we, we think about what new life in Christ really looks like. And it's being in Christ and continuing to remain in him is the only thing that will bring moral growth and truly change our behavior. That's the only thing. And, and we're going to see that. So let's jump into the text we just read and let's talk about what it looks like to have new life in Christ. The first thing that we see 
from going back to chapter 2, verses 20 through 23, is this, that we have been set free from the world. And Paul says, if you died with Christ, meaning that if we are believers this morning, if we have experienced salvation through Jesus, then we have died with Christ. And so he's saying, he says, if you have died with Christ, and he asks the question, he says, if you have died with Christ, he says, why do you live as if you still belonged to the world? Okay, Colossian believers, church in America, if you have truly died with Christ, why do you still belong to the world? Now, this doesn't mean exactly what we probably think it does on the surface when we read that. Our tendency when we read that is probably going to be to default to, well, when we come to faith in Jesus, we stop doing certain things. We don't, we don't live like the unbelieving world. If you have a fundamentalist background like me, you understand what I'm talking about when I say this, or a legalistic background. We hear that verse and we automatically think about, don't do this, do this, don't go here, go here, look this way, act this way, eat this, don't eat this, drink this, don't drink this. We think of rules. And that's not what Paul's saying. When he, what he's saying is we're still living in the world but we're not to live as if the world has power over us. We, it, what it means is that we're to live in a way to where we are not living under the power and the influence of the world. We've talked a lot about this. In fact, David, I know, brought this out a lot over the last couple of weeks that our culture constantly is telling us things. And, and we don't live into the things that our culture is telling us, but rather we live into the things that Jesus is telling us. But it does not mean that we are free from all rules. That's not what Paul's saying. And, and so, see, a lot of times that's what happens. When we talk about grace, people tend to, to err either on truth or grace. And we tend to say when we talk about grace and, and being free in Christ, people will accuse us and say, well, you just think you can live any way you want to live and you don't have to do anything and everything's okay for you. No, that's not what grace is and that's not what freedom is. It just means that, that <clears throat> we... Uh, we have freedom, but it doesn't mean that we, we don't have to obey and submit. But what Paul's saying is that when he talks about dying with Christ, he's saying that we are not to live as if we are still in the world or belong to the world. In fact, he goes on to talk about after that, he says, why do you submit to regulations? Don't handle, don't touch, don't taste he says, all these regulations refer to what is destined to perish by being used up. They are human commands and doctrines. And so restrictions and regulations will never lead to true life change. That's what Paul's trying to tell us. They never achieve the desired result. Rules and regulations always serve to further feed our sinful nature. And if we don't believe that, all I encourage you to do is take a sign, make a sign that says wet paint, do not touch, put it on something, even if it's dry, just put it there and see how many people walk up and touch it to see if it's really wet. Why do we do that? But we see it. We're not supposed to touch it. Do not do that. Well, let me just, is it still wet? That, that proves like it just does nothing but to feed our sinful nature. The desire of these people we see when they were trying to, to tell the Colossian believers to saying, hey, don't touch this, don't taste this, don't handle this talking about whether it was festivals or dietary things or, or, or Sabbaths or whatever it may have been, whatever the thing was they were trying to, to infiltrate the believers with or get them to adhere to, the desire of these people may have been truly to serve God. I honestly believe as I read through Scripture and, and we, we read through how the Pharisees and the scribes and all these people were, I honestly believe that they truly thought they were serving God in their mind. Now, it doesn't mean that they were, but in their mind, they thought this is what that we need to do to truly serve God. I think they, they thought that. And I think there's a lot of well-meaning people that think they are truly following Jesus in the same way. And their desire may have been to truly serve God and to keep their flesh in check. I think all of us would say that it's our desire to not let our fleshly and sinful desires rule our lives. But what they did was just further feed the flesh. These disciplines that they did, they were disciplines for their own sake. 
They, they didn't serve to further any relationship with Jesus. They just became an end unto themselves. And Paul lets us know that when we do things like that, what happens is it puffs us up and it makes us arrogant and it makes us prideful because inevitably we're going to look down on someone who doesn't do those things. I've been guilty of that. I, can rem- I find myself fighting this all the time. And the more we fall further into grace and the more we understand grace, the, the less... This is a reality, but I still catch myself sometimes when when I find out someone commits a sin or they're doing something, I'm like, man, whew, can't believe they did it. Man, I'd never do something like that, you know, and and thinking stuff like that. Or we look at them and say, man, man, what in the world's wrong with them doing that, you know? And the thing is, is that it just puffs us up where I may say, well, man, I can't believe that, that they don't dress the way I dress, or I can't believe that they don't have the conviction that I have on this. And what happens is I look down my nose on someone who maybe is in a different place in their walk with Jesus than I am, and it's what it leads to. But yet this idea that we can defeat the flesh and attain a higher spiritual and moral state through self-denial or self-mortification, it is futile. It is absolutely not going to happen. It leads us to a place of defeat. It leads us to a place of discouragement. And, and I know uh, Tangi has told me things like this where she's been to women's conferences in the past. And I'll never forget, she went to one years ago and it was back in our fundamentalist days. And she came back and she said, like, I felt worse about myself than I did when I went. I felt like a failure as a mom, a failure as a wife, because it was like, well, ladies, you should be doing this and you should be doing that. And, and well... We don't want to get to the place to where we're trying to defeat the flesh and attain a higher spiritual or moral state through these things like that. We're trying to do something that can only be gained and found in the person and work of Jesus. But this leads us to a place when we do these things. Paul's talking about where we elevate our rules and our disciplines over and above Christ. And that's what the Pharisees did. They elevated things to be above their relationship with God. We see that time and time again in their interactions with Jesus. But I love how this this one person put this. I don't know who said this, but it's such a great quote. Having rules in the head is no substitute for obedience from the heart. Listen to that again. Having rules in the head is no substitute for obedience from the heart. See, we can have rules up here all day long, but it does not take the place of true heart obedience to Jesus. Rules do not create morality, but they are attractive to people who fool themselves into thinking they do. Now, we can legislate and we can make rules and we can do things and and we can even go back to the law because we look at the law that was given to Israel. Do not kill, do not steal, do not commit adultery, do not covet. Those things did not actually do anything to curb any of that. In fact, all it did was it it, it just flourished and it abounded. And so rules do not create morality. We can make rules and we can have things that we put in place, but it does not create people who are truly obeying and living out their faith in Jesus. Everything in our world, everything in our culture is all performance-based. Everything pushes towards our performance Our jobs are performance-based. We treat our marriages as performance-based. We treat our relationships with other people as performance-based, meaning that it's kind of like if you're not performing up to the thing, the standard I think you should perform at as my friend, then you know what? You know, maybe we're just not going to be friends anymore. Well, if my wife is not performing up to the standard that I'm holding her to, and she's not performing as I think she should, then it affects how I see her and how I feel. And, and, you, and it affects all of us that way. Our jobs, it's the same way. Our, our, our pay and our promotions and our position, everything's based on our performance. And that is so counterculture to what Jesus, what Jesus provides for us in a relationship with him. Our relationship is not performance-based. It is all based in who Jesus is and what he has done. But let's look at the second thing, and this is the second division that we see, and where we're going to be spending the the remainder of our time is in chapter 3. We see that we have been set free from the world. But then secondly, we see we have been set free to live a new life. Not only have we been set free from the world, we've been set free from this idea of having to perform to be accepted by God. 
but we've been set free to live this new life. And then Paul says in verse one of chapter three, so if you have been raised with Christ, seek the things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. He says, set your minds on the things above, not on earthly things. He says, for you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. We have been raised with Christ. So our status in Christ requires a new way of life we've seen. This new life of obedience to Christ, I want you to understand it does not depend on you and it does not depend on me. Thank God it does not depend on us. Can we say amen to that? Because if it depended on us, we all would be up a creek without a paddle. Because if it depended on us, we have no hope. And that's one of the things that that I think has been so freeing for me is understanding it's not, well, if I mess up or if I sin, or I'm going to mess up and I'm going to sin and I'm going to do things that are going to cause me to fall flat on my face. I can tell you that there have been times and there will be continue to be times in my life as long as I'm breathing in this world that I'm going to miserably fail Jesus and that I'm going to sin and do things that you would even think that well, you're a pastor. I can't believe you would do something like that. Or I can't believe that you would think that way or say that. or what? Because I'm going, why? Because we're all going to do that. And so it does not depend on us. Thank God for that. Paul says in Galatians, early, uh, Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, he says, I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That verse is so freeing because how many times have you and I encountered someone who talks about saying, you know, I just don't know that I could ever be a Christian because I can never live the Christian life. We've all probably heard someone say something around that, that, that thought. And you know what I tell people? You're right. You can't. You never will be able in your own strength to live out the Christian life. I will never be either. And thank God it doesn't depend on us. In fact, Paul says that the life that you and I now live in the body, we live by faith in the Son of God. And we've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer us who live, but it's Christ who lives in us. And so <clears throat> we've been raised with Christ. This requires a new way of life for us. And this new way of life that we've been set free to live, it's a, it's a life of obedience. And so we must put to death the sinful desires that characterize our old way of life. Look at verses five through eight. We see what Paul is saying. He says in verse five, therefore put to death what belongs to your earthly nature. And he gives a list and I'm not gonna spend an exhaustive amount of time talking about each point, but he says that we're to put to death what it, it belongs to our earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desire and greed, which is idolatry. He says, because of these, God's wrath is coming upon the disobedient. And you once walked in these things when you were living in them. He says, but now put away all the following, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and filthy language from your mouth. So we see that Paul makes it clear that we are either dead in sin or we are dead to sin. And so he tells us that we're to, we're to put to death those things. And he gives that list and, and, and so the interesting thing is he gives that, that list of things and it covers a lot of territory. And he says, and he says, you once walked in these things when you were living in them, meaning not that you struggled with them, but he's saying that the people that he's writing the letter to at one time, they were living in sin. They were dead in sin. They were given over to sexual desire. They were given over to impurity, to lust, to greed, which he says is idolatry. He's saying, y'all were living into these things. It was your life. It was the way you lived. <clears throat> and so he makes it clear that we are either dead in sin or we're going to be dead to sin. <clears throat> in fact, we see that he tells us that we're to put to death those things. Those things that we were dead in, he says, you got to put those to death. And as followers of Jesus, we are always going to be a work in progress on this side of eternity. And so this is a daily thing. It is a thing that happens every single day of our lives. We're going to have to put to death our sinful nature. 
Every day I get up, you know what my biggest problem is? It's not the unbelieving world. My biggest problem is not Washington, D.C. My biggest problem stares me in the face in the mirror every day when I get up. It's me and it's you. And, and so we're the biggest problem. You know how we want, and, and I, this is one of the things that honestly, I wish the church, I wish we could grasp this. If we want to see our world change, we want to see our community change, it's got to start with us changing. It starts with me changing my heart. And it starts with me allowing Jesus to, to do more in me and Jesus to change me and make me look more like him and live that out. Guys, that's how we see change happen. And, and so I know that when I get up, Every day I got to, to kill my enemy. You know, it's my sinful nature. I got to put that to death. All those desires that are within me. You know, here's the thing we don't like to talk about, but even among people who are in leadership, if you could really see what was in the human heart, I don't care who you are, whether you're a pastor, whether you're an elder, you're a lay leader, you're a small group leader, it doesn't matter. If you knew what was in our hearts, it's some pretty evil, wicked stuff. I mean, it's pretty messed up. And so every day I've got to put that to death. I've got to kill it. And it's a work in progress. And this is why Paul reminds the Colossians and us of our need to put to death our earthly nature because it is a daily thing every single day. I love what Erwin McManus, he's the lead pastor of Mosaic Church. He says, we are all hypocrites in transition. I am not who I want to be, but I am on the journey there. And thankfully, I am not whom I used to be. I love that. We're all hypocrites in transition, meaning we all still do hypocritical things. We all fall and we fail. But he says, I may, he says I'm not who I want to be. And I can say amen to that. I'm not who I, I want to be more like Jesus every day. And I'm not there yet. I'm striving to be. But he says, I'm on the journey there. That should characterize every single one of us. We are on the journey there together. That we are on the journey to looking more like Jesus every day. We are on the journey to, to Jesus living through us in a greater way every day. And hopefully we can say, thankfully, I'm not whom I used to be. I may not be where I need to be exactly, but God has done some things in my life and changed my heart. And so we see that in this new life that we must put on the new nature of Christ. In verses 9 through 10, notice what Paul says to the church here. He says, Do not lie to one another, since you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self. He says, You are being renewed in knowledge according to the image of your creator. We see that we put on the new nature and we're being renewed. And so what Paul is saying when he talks about putting on this new nature, what he's not saying is he's not talking about you or I reforming our ways or trying to change our lives for the better. There's so many times that we try to do that. Even as, as believers, we're guilty of that. I've, ser I've shared this before. How many times when we read Galatians 5 and we see what the fruit of the Spirit is, how many of us, let's just be real and honest, in this room, this moment. How many of us, when we read the fruit of the Spirit, our first reaction is, man, I need to do better with that. Yeah. Let's be honest. Yeah, I, I need to do better being more loving. I need to do better having more joy. And I need to be better having more peace. That's not what our reaction should be. It should not be that we're thinking, I need to do better. The Christian life is not about us trying to change for the better or make our lives better in our own power. It's not about giving up our vices and accepting a few moral principles. It's not about saying, well, you know, I, I really have a, this is kind of a vice in my life that I need to, I need to give this up and, and, and just, you know, I need to be a better moral person. That, that is not what the Christian life is about at all. The idea, it's, Paul's conveying this idea when he says that we are to, to put on the new self, and he says we're to, to put to death. And he talks about we're to, we take off the old self and put it off and put on the new. He's given this idea of one taking off a dirty garment and putting on something clean. So think about it this way. It would be kind of like, and, and 
I, you know, I don't know if anybody does this or not, so no judgment if you do, but it could be like, you know, maybe you got your favorite shirt or your favorite pair of jeans or something, and you know, you, you, you don't want to wash them after you wore them one time, and like, hey, you continue to wear it maybe two or three times, you know, and, but then let's just say it's like, you know, I'm going to keep wearing that, and let's say, you know, it just, I, I'm wearing it, and I'm weeks in, and months in, and well, by then, I've got some dirt, Got a little bit of filth on me. Maybe I've been over here painting or something and I got some paint on me. Maybe I got some other, I've spilled some food on me. I got stains on my clothes and all that. And maybe by this time, they're kind of starting to smell a little bit. It would be like me trying to go in there and, and spray some Axe body spray on with some dirty clothes and, and try to be spruced up and say, well, I'm going to freshen up and, and try to be presentable. That, that's the idea of what it is when we're trying to do this in our own power. What we need to do is throw those things in the trash, go get some new clothes, and put on the new garment. That's what Paul's saying. It's this idea of taking off this dirty, filthy garment and putting on something that's clean. And he's saying that's what we're to do when we're to put on the new self. When we put on Christ, it's not us covering up our filth. It's not us trying to spray Axe body spray over our, our, our sin. He's saying it's putting on a new garment that smells clean, that looks clean, because it is clean. And sometimes we, we get dirt, filth, and stains on our clothes, and they can never be gotten out no matter how many times we try to wash them. And that's what Paul's getting at. We just have to get new clothes. We've got to put on a new way of life. So and then in verse 11, we see <clears throat> the, the last thing here as part of this new life. <clears throat> we are continuing to grow in the image of Christ. In verse 11, we see Paul says this. He says, In Christ there is not Greek and Jew, circumcision and uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, slave and free, but Christ is all and in all. And then back in verse 10, that he says that we are being renewed in the knowledge according to the image of our Creator. Our being renewed, that phrase suggests that it is a continuous process. He didn't say, you, you know... You are renewed, as in a one and done, you are being, meaning it's a continual. And one commentator put it this way. He says, it requires a continual mortification of what is, in fact, already dead, a continual actualization of an already existing new creation. And so it is a continuous thing, and this renewal does not result from our own efforts. So I want us to be very clear on this. This kind of renewal, this kind of putting on of the new self, of putting on Christ, it does not come about from you and I trying harder. It does not. Because it is something that Jesus does in us through the power of the Holy Spirit. This renewal comes from us being joined to Christ, who is the image of the invisible God. No system of do's or don'ts can ever create the image of God in you and in me. And so this renewal comes from us spending time in the presence of Jesus. And it comes from our relationship with Jesus. And so let's wrap this up as we close out today. <clears throat> what, is this, what does this look like? Well, new life in Christ, it's not about rules and regulations. It's not about do this, don't do this. Now, let me preface that and say it doesn't mean that we can go out and just live a life in sin and say, well, it's okay because there's grace for that. There is grace available when we sin. But what it means is that our standing in Christ is not affected by what I do or I don't do. And here's the thing, and this is hard, hard, hard for us to wrap our minds around, that no matter what you and I do, no matter what sin we commit, if we are in Christ, if you go out and fall flat on your face tomorrow and you sin in a major big way, you are no less accepted by God than you were before you sinned. You are no less, and, and, and I know we hear that and we go, whoa, wait, 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 but they're living in sin or you're doing, but here, or you've sinned, you've done this horrible thing. But your acceptance was never based on your performance. Remember that. Your acceptance is based on the finished work of Jesus. It's based on who he is. It's based on the cross. It's based on the shed blood of Jesus. And so 
The reason why God cannot, does not accept us any less when we go out here and we majorly blow it is because God cannot accept his son any less than he already. He's fully accepted the payment. He fully accepted Jesus' sacrifice. And it's so freeing when we understand that no matter, even if you and I, let's just say, we go out here and, and this week we commit some major sins. I want us to understand God does not love us any less because he does not love Jesus any less. And when we understand that, that is so freeing that I know that not if, but when I mess up, because I'm going to mess up and I'm going to sin, and there's sometimes I do stuff that I just absolutely know it's sin before I do it. And I do it anyway. Why? Because I'm just, that's my nature. I'm wired that way. And there, it's, and there are just times that, like, I know you've never done this, but, you know, someone cuts you off in traffic and you, you have that thought about them and you think things that are ungodly about someone created in the image of God and you justify that. But, like, and it could even be something about, like, I know I shouldn't do something and maybe I do it anyway. Whatever it may be. And, and, and the thing is, when that happens, I need to understand that I'm still fully loved and accepted by God in Christ because of who Jesus is and what Jesus has done. And because of that, I should be overwhelmed with, with the feeling of, that I need to repent. And I should be overwhelmed with the fact that I need to flee and I need to run to the Father and confess that sin and repent of that sin and seek His forgiveness. But when Christ takes hold of you and me, and we give our struggle in life wholly to Him. Transformation begins to happen in that moment. New life in Christ is more than you and I just getting rid of a few vices. <clears throat> it's more than us just trying to do our spiritual lives with just mere church attendance and, and checking off a list. See, I think in Western culture, that's what we've done. We have lessened following Jesus to, I, I go to church, I read my Bible, I pray. You know what? Lost people can do those things too. You don't have to be a believer to attend church gatherings. You don't have to be a believer to read the Bible. You don't have to be a believer to even pray. People pray all the time. People pray to different gods and things that aren't really gods. And, and so anybody can do those things. Anybody can get rid of a few vices. We do that every year at New Year's. It's called New Year's resolutions. It's more than simply trying to do better. So I want to ask some questions as we get ready to respond. First question, have we truly died with Christ or are we still living as if we belong to the world? That's the starting point. Have we died with Christ? If you're here today and you've never repented and placed your faith and trust in Jesus for your eternal salvation, that is your starting point. That is the place to start for all of us that we die with Christ and we don't live as if we belong to the world anymore <clears throat> And that's more than just not looking like the unbelieving world around us. It's not just trying to be, just trying to say, well, we don't do this, we don't do that, you know, whatever, you know, fill in the blank. But have we truly died with Christ? Do we know Jesus as Savior? Do we have a relationship with Him? Second question, are we living in a way that reflects that we have been raised with Christ? Not that we're, it's a list of things we're checking off. Not living in a way that we're just checking the box. Yep, church gathering, check. Yeah, devotion, check. Oh, yep, invited someone to church, check. Oh, yeah, gave some money in the offering, check. Oh, no, didn't cuss this week, check. Oh, didn't look at porn this week, check. Do we treat our relationship with Jesus? It's more than that. And so it's not a list of checking off, but it's a pursuing a relationship with Jesus. It means that we are pursuing a relationship with Him actively. Are we daily putting to death the sinful desires that lead us away from Christ? Are we daily putting to death our sinful desires? Meaning that we are open when we're talking to God and we're spending time with Him in that relationship. Are we being honest about what our sinful desires are that we're struggling with and we are striving to put them to death. And the last two questions. 
Do we view all the things that we do, reading our Bibles, praying, giving, church attendance, as something that makes us more spiritual and more accepted by God? Because I guarantee you at some point in our lives, we've all looked at it. Well, I'm closer to God. And I've actually heard this before. Well, that person's not right with God. They don't even give. That person's not right with God. They ain't been here. That person's not right with God. They're not praying. They're not reading their Bibles. Your right standing with God has nothing to do with any of those things. Your right standing with God has to do with Jesus and what Jesus has done. Now, those are things that flow out of our relationship with him. Yes, we should be reading scripture. We should be spending time in God's word. We should be praying. We should be giving. We should be gathering with the church. We should be looking more like Jesus. But those are not things we do to gain acceptance. Those things we do because we have been accepted. And we've got to understand that. And there's the last question, and I'm done. Are our hearts truly being transformed by Christ so that each day we are looking more like him? Are our hearts truly being transformed by Christ so that each day we're looking more like him? Because that's the key. And that, that's the thing that I know David and I have been trying to drive home in this series in Colossians. When we make everything about Jesus, everything about Jesus, everything else falls into place. And that's the thing. Are we making it our life's pursuit as his followers to say, you know what? I want to look more like him tomorrow than I did today. And how we do that, it's not about checking a box and it's not what we do or what we don't do. But how we look more like him, guys, it's kind of simple. It's so simple we overlook it. You know how we become more like him? We spend time in this every day. We saturate our lives with this. And then we pray and ask the Holy Spirit to open our eyes and open our hearts to what's being said. And we're asking the Holy Spirit, if there's something in my life that doesn't look like Jesus, point that out to me so you can work on that. And it's not about, like I said, what we do or what we don't do, but as we spend time in here, that's why we've been pushing hard and pushing so much for you guys to get in on this reading plan. And for you guys to spend time in Scripture. For us as a church to spend time in Scripture. Because I just believe that as we do that as followers of Jesus. And we live that out in biblical community. In the church gathering and small groups throughout the week. And we're spurring one another on to live out our faith. That's what's going to produce true change in our lives. And so that's the question. Are we striving to look more like Jesus every day? So let's all stand. And I don't know how you would respond to each of those questions. But however we would respond, God is calling us to respond in repentance and faith. And so that means whatever any of those, whatever question it may be or questions that we're struggling with, what God's asking of us is that we would allow the Holy Spirit to convict our hearts, that we would allow the Holy Spirit to move on our hearts so that we would surrender that to Him so that that area of our life could reflect Jesus more. And so I want to encourage you, we're going to open this time up. If you want to come down front and pray, you can do that. If you want to pray in your seats, you can do that. If you want to gather with others and pray, you can do that. But I want to ask you to respond today. Have we died with Christ? Have we been raised with Christ? And are we actively, daily, pursuing a relationship that makes us look more like Jesus every day. Let's all sing as we respond today.